So, Michael, so you've been building startups for a long time. Yes. Since you were very young, 13? Uh, sure, you could call those businesses the early <laughs> stages. Yes, <laughs> early stages. So, how many startups or businesses have you built so far? I, I tried to do a count because I knew yeah. this question was coming. Yeah. Count. Uh, about 14 that I would consider businesses. Yeah. And then, you know, some of the stuff that you knew earlier, uh, looking back, I was buying and selling Pokemon cards. Yeah. Buy, buy low, sell high. Yeah. So <laughs> this kind of stuff is like middle school. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't consider that a business, mm -hmm. but uh, actual revenue generating yeah. businesses of value proposition, probably closer to 10, 10 to 13. 10 to 13. Yeah. So what's the very first one? Uh, the very first one that I consider to be a real yeah. business. Uh, was a company that was called Auto Quick Trade, and it was this um, this idea that my, my parents wanted to sell their car, and the dealership offered them one thousand dollars, and I thought that was ridiculous mm -hmm. because I knew you could go on Craigslist and you could sell for more than that, even if it's at the time when I compare like one thousand to three thousand, I'm like, oh, you could get three times the amount of money, and so created the service that basically you can uh, inquire and you can say, I want to sell my vehicle. Our mm -hmm. company would then more or less take your car, put it up on Craigslist and sell it for you. Oh. And it helps people overcome language barriers. Yep. It helps people yep. overcome the, the fear of having to deal with that type of transactions with yep. strangers. Um, and so it's, it's really a great lesson. Anybody could have started that business. Yep. Uh, you're really just, you're, post, you're making a Craigslist posting on somebody else's behalf. Yeah. Um, so when thinking about business ideas, I think it doesn't have to be complex, especially if it's the first business. What's the easiest thing that you can think of that you can execute and just implement the day after? Yeah. And so, you know, we ended up just doing that. We, we put people's cars up and we sold it for them, had these transactions. Uh, and then over time, relatively quickly, we learned that there's no money there. <laughs> there's not a lot of money in buying and selling these yeah. cars on Craigslist. Yeah. Um, and also, people don't really value a couple thousand dollars mm. that much. Right. They're, they're selling for 1,000, 2,000, but mm. they can, and we have to take a commission in between. Yeah. Not necessarily worthwhile for anyone. Mm. Um, so, you know, when I, when I look at business, it's where can you provide value? Do that, and then you can figure out monetization later. Yeah. And it turns out that there's no monetization opportunities, and you just stop doing it. And that was right. the case. Uh, on my LinkedIn, you'll see there's a section that I call Startup Graveyard. It's just okay. all the companies that yeah. I've started and like, just didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that was definitely one of them. Yeah, so this is one lesson learned where you need to have a scalable business yeah. to, to be make it fall that they right. so that is the same right? yeah and i just yeah. want to take this opportunity to yeah. say this is one of the first fireside chats where i was not sent any questions <laughs> so this is really yeah. exciting for me yeah. too i have no idea yeah. if this sounds rehearsed it's not i don't know this <laughs> well for me i haven't really think about the question <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so it's all good it's all good it's about the question what's your favorite color, color. <laughs> I was not prepared. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do a question, question and answer later on. Q and A. We'll have a fifteen minutes Q and A later on. Um, we'll do fifteen, uh, four to five minutes of um, of the five star chat. Yeah. Yeah. Forgot to mention about that. <laughs> so I guess I'll save that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, so first, first venture that you figure out is not really going anywhere. So you stop and and you try to think of something else. Yeah. So I, I think another thing that's important especially in the early stages of entrepreneurship is to not define success so strictly. So I've like started lots of companies, but some of them made $10,000, some of them made $100,000. Yeah. And so that was never really that important to me mm -hmm. in the early stages. Uh, so Auto Quick Trade made some money. Mm -hmm. For me, that was like, hey, I made a few people's lives better. Yeah. I got their vehicles sold yeah. and bought. Um, so that to me was a, uh, was a success. Mm -hmm. And so much of the barrier to entrepreneurship, I think, is if you're aiming for this billion dollar exit, then you're never mm -hmm. going to end up doing anything because the, the goal is just so it's far fun. away. Um, and so, you know, for me, it was just like, okay, this I made ten thousand dollars with this business. How do I make twenty thousand dollars? How do I make thirty thousand dollars? It's an iterative process, uh, really, like any other skill. Yeah. yeah. You start that because this is because you were about to buy your first car. Yeah, so it was it was because I had it wasn't I was about to we did end oh. up selling. Oh, I see, I, I see, I see, I see. Uh, and you can kind of tell like the dealer didn't care. They're just like, hey, what's the lowest amount we can give these people? Yeah. And I definitely got the sense I was like, oh, I think they they know that and yeah. they know to lowball certain customers. Uh, uh, and so that was what I was like, oh well, if there's an opportunity to help other families like mine mm -hmm. buy and sell vehicles for whatever reason yeah. it is. Uh, wouldn't that be great? And then you quickly realize that the people who sell those types of cars are not always nice families. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are some sketchy vehicles that I'm like, I don't know if we should buy or sell. Yeah. How long of time is that? Like, what year is that? Oh, um, just before you were maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, 
years ago. Ten years ago. So, two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. That's that's the problem. It's blurry when we go up. Yeah. Yeah. So what what kind of stuff do you start after that? From yeah. The so lessons that you learn. So some of the later businesses I was at that time entering university. Mm. Um, is anyone going to school right now? Everyone's graduating. Okay. Um, so at that time, I was just entering school and I was studying like web design and stuff yeah. like that. So um, that was just the natural thing. So I'm learning this at school. How do I build a business with the skills that I'm picking up? And so starting a uh, what started as like a freelance mm -hmm. web design service. Yeah. Um, that was it was quite natural. Uh, I thought I was charging a lot at the time. Mm -hmm. It was like a hundred dollars per website. Mm -hmm. and I spent a lot of time on it. Yeah. Um, and so as you can imagine, I got lots of clients because I was charging hundred dollars mm -hmm. per yeah. website. Uh, and then with the demand, I got other students involved. Yeah. I'm like, hey, let's 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 get more people to build these mm -hmm. websites, and that eventually became one of the first uh, web agencies. Yeah. And there was a few iterations, but it yeah. was a web design agency. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I learned that you know it's not just about delivering the service. There's a sales process involved. Yeah. There's customer service. Uh, so it was the next iteration. Always trying to help people solve problems. Mm -hmm. And Auto Quick Creator was helping people buy and sell vehicles. In this case. Um, nowadays, it's hard to believe that people really are still buying and selling websites, but at that time, it was new. Mm -hmm. Lots of people didn't have websites. Yeah. Um, so it was good timing for that, and then gradually increasing prices during the time. Yeah, so you span the demand, yeah. and then you kind of build a team to serve yeah. the demand. So you mentioned how far this is uh, what they were to do. Um, so at that time, I think we... It was like four or five of us that was collaborating, and then at a certain point, we realized that it just, again, it's like it doesn't make financial sense. We're mm -hmm. charging basically nothing, mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really care about money. None of my other people who were involved really cared mm -hmm. about money. We were just students building right. uh, a very small business. Yeah. Um, and then so we iterated a few times within that era. I kind of played around with like a video production agency, yeah. and that's where we had the opportunity to film projects for really cool brands. So that was a different approach as well. With um, the web agency, we were just servicing uh, somewhat local, no-name mom and pop shop. With the video agency, we wanted big brands. We wanted to work with recognizable companies. Um, and so we knew we couldn't charge. And so we did it for free. Mm. And we went to brands like Samsung, yeah. like Blends, um, and we're just like, hey, we're gonna make a video for free for your events, for your promotional, whatever it is. Um, and you would imagine that that process could be difficult, but really our sell was, we're going to make it with or without you. Mm -hmm. We're going to show it to you, <laughs> and then you decide yeah. if you're going to use it. Why? Uh, and that's how we got our, our portfolio of, uh -huh. you know, of, of pretty cool uh, yeah. companies that yeah. we started to make these videos for. And that allowed us to then kickstart more revenue generating yeah. projects. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind too, is if you're starting a business, revenue doesn't, depending on how much you need money at the mm -hmm. time, you don't necessarily need to prioritize monetization up front. Focus on figuring out what you can do for people, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, once you've proven that you're valuable, then you can start to figure out what does that look like. Uh, that was the, the direction that we took with the video agency. And then that, that, was, that was a different lesson. We had five co-founders in that mm -hmm. business. So the lesson that I learned there was, there's an optimal number of co-founders yeah. that's usually not yeah. five. Yeah. Yeah. five is maybe too, it is. too many it is. people. Uh, too many voices, yeah. too many, are we going to uh, make videos for commercial, are we going to mm -hmm. go make videos for non-profit? Yeah. So that didn't quite work out, mm -hmm. um, and that was, but it was a good lesson. Yeah. Since then, I've never started another company with five. five. <laughs> yeah. Even now, I hear some, some people are like, hey, I have a business with seven co-founders, yeah. and, and it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. Uh, and I have no advice for that, mm -hmm. seven co-founders. <laughs> Your face. <laughs> <laughs> so you eventually find figure out that too many founders, too many voices, no directions. Yeah. So, yeah. So how how how's the next steps? You kind of like stop their whole business or Yeah, so um, as I was mentioning earlier, there's there's kind of a couple agencies around that time. Uh, when that didn't work out, I didn't have the video production mm -hmm. skills, and so the partner who did wasn't yeah. really involved anymore, yeah. and so we winded that down. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I've, I've had failed businesses for yeah. lots of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's monetization, sometimes yeah. it's co-founders. Uh, and then I went back to revisit the web world, which is mm -hmm. something that I was familiar with. Right. So uh, I was saying earlier we were charging very little for websites. Uh, I still wanted to preserve that spirit mm -hmm. because that's as a as a pretty mediocre web developer, you can't charge that much. So keep in mind, it's not like I was a good web designer. <laughs> I was a bad web designer selling bad websites, trying to build a business around selling bad websites. Yeah. Um, and so I, it's not like I could charge a lot, but I wanted to find out some way to build a sustainable business around yeah. it. 
and that became um, what was later branded as Witty Cookie, and it's a web agency that charges a monthly recurring revenue wow. model. It's very common nowadays, you hear SaaS all the time, but at the time, that was not a common lingo. Yeah. And the inspiration came from uh, my, my co-founder who had a gym membership, that mm. he, he never goes to the gym, yep. Yep. Like, clearly never goes to the yeah. gym. <laughs> and, and he was just so frustrated, he was like, why do I keep paying this like, monthly yeah. subscription? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, you know, that's kind of smart. What, what if we applied the gym membership model mm -hmm. to web design? Yeah. Because then that allows me to say, I'm not charging $1,000 yeah. for a website, yeah. I'm charging $10 or $20 a month for a right. website. Um, and so that became the foundation of that business, which eventually did, did, did do pretty well. But the promise was, you can pay $20 for a website, you don't have to keep it. Mm -hmm. but if you want to keep it, then keep paying us $20 right. per month. Uh, so the, the interesting lesson there is sometimes innovation doesn't have to come in the offering. Uh, a lot of times I think when we're thinking about building businesses, we're trying to innovate on the, this unique value proposition. Uh, for Witty Cookie, there was nothing unique about building websites for people. What was unique was we combined the pricing model yeah. of one industry into an industry that's not traditionally priced that way. So to get a website at that time, you would have had to pay a professional maybe a couple thousand dollars. We offered an alternative for them to pay 10 to $20. Yeah. Uh, but over time, we make that money back yeah. through add-ons, and then we started adding additional services like analytics mm -hmm. and SEO, um, and so built the business from ground up. So yeah. that was an interesting lesson in that there's so many different pieces of the business, and all of them can be innovated to create a new business opportunity. So that's very good. So it's basically, it's, it's not freemium, but it's really cheaper or very low price where they can yes. afford. Like, and your target audience are usually small, medium-sized, mm -hmm businesses that that won't be able to afford like a you know big agency where they charge you that's right a lot of money so this is like the, the demand that you're you're not getting and you can't kind of supplying them what they they can cut afford and they can cut use yeah so yeah. that's where you go from there there's a concept called underserved market which yeah. is in, the, in a market there's all these stakeholders some of them are served as in there's a good solution good pricing model the underserved market is generally where early stage business opportunities mm -hmm. are so there's a group of people at any given time in every market they want something and they're not currently getting it. in our case um, the, the insight or innovation was that there are people who want websites and are not willing to pay more than $20 for mm. websites. Now, not the best market, of mm. course, um, but created enough of an entry point for us to just get in there yeah. and then expand. Yeah. Um, so when I think about new venture development, it's always, you're trying to penetrate a market and penetration, as, as mm. the word implies, you want to be as needle-like as possible. How do you penetrate that first piece? Um, and that always starts with that underserved time. Yeah. So this model actually help you kind of expand and then the, the agency can kind of expand. Yes. Is this still running or like it is still running. Yeah. I'm not operationally involved. Yeah. My yeah. co-founder who I started the company yeah. with still runs the company to this day. That's good. Um, and nowadays it's more than twenty dollars, I think yeah. like two hundred dollars yeah. a month or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and now we offer a lot more services than just yeah. web design. But that was the entry point. And I think so much of business is about finding that entry point. And going back to what I was trying to communicate earlier is it's hard to build a business if you keep trying to think of the end vision. What is this going to be? A great example is always like Mark Zuckerberg never mm -hmm. knew that Facebook was going to become a VR headset yeah. company with an ad network. He wanted to build this, this like hot or not thing for his campus. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the entry point. What is the underserved market? For him, it was. People at Harvard didn't know uh, who their classmates were, yeah. or they wanted to meet other people. And that was the underserved market. Yeah. There was no revenue opportunity, but he served that market, and that market expanded and expanded, and then eventually found where the revenue potential would be. That's good. So this, this agency, you have two performers, so just you and the It's uh, one, yeah. It's one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So you so learned the lesson, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, just slightly different lesson there is, yeah. later on, learn that odd number of co-founders are better than <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, with five, it's, it's, it's odd numbers, but it's too many. Yeah. With two, it's small, but yeah. if you disagree, that's it. Right? Yeah. And so I was thankful in that we didn't disagree on a lot yeah. of things, but in retrospect, I think odd number of co-founders tend to help. Yeah. So three will be a, the magic number. I think, it's, I think it's a good number. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's, it depends on so many other factors. Yeah. Um, sometimes I find that the complexity of your business, but mm -hmm. there might be a business out there that justifies having five co-founders. If it's very complex mm -hmm. and there's lots of different moving parts, maybe you do want more co-founders. Yeah. Uh, but threes work well for me. Yeah. So this company basically starts from like a, a really serving small businesses to right now you have to scale up to a different set. Um, yeah, I would say like mid-market is probably yeah. what we call it. I still wouldn't say, you know, it's not so enterprise. enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but it still remains to be a great alternative for people who don't want to hire a web designer yeah. or they don't want to use Squarespace or Wix or yeah. anything like that. So it continues to serve a very unique market with a very unique pricing model. Yeah, that's good. So this is still a, a good lesson where you learn more from, from your right. journey, right? Yeah. So what's the next project for you? Uh, after so that? after that, and this is taking me through time. Yeah. Um, after that, I, I went to Toronto and I mm. applied for a program called the Next 36, yes. which is they kind of fly 36 people to Toronto, mm -hmm. 36 undergrad students yeah. to Toronto every year. Um, so I applied for that, I got in, and that's where I met my current co-founders. Yeah. Um, so that was also a really interesting lesson too, is in so many of my businesses in the earlier stages were agencies, web design, buy and sell cars. There's, I, I just realized in retrospect we missed like at least two other companies mm -hmm. in between, yeah. um, but they were non-technical. And mm -hmm. so my pivot into a uh, really a technical yeah. entrepreneur and building tech startups was really upon meeting my co-founders mm -hmm. who are both very, very smart engineers, still to this day is the smartest engineering, uh, engineers that I know. Um, and that had pivoted my career into starting to build technical products. Um, so the lesson that I learned there really is just the co-founders are so important. Uh, and I always kind of go back to saying that the business that you start is really just a combination yeah. of the co-founders. So if you start and it's two business people, you'll have a business-oriented business. If it's two engineers, it's going to be tools mm -hmm. for developers. It's mm -hmm. going to be very technical. Um, so I come from a background of product design. They were engineers. Mm -hmm. And that naturally created a lot of interesting, well-designed and well-developed mm -hmm. products. Yeah. With weaknesses because we're not we don't come from a business background. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to things like enterprise sales, mm -hmm. that's not what we're good at. So yeah. traditionally we don't tend to build enterprise sales products. Yes. Um, so upon meeting them, I started a company called Needle HR, which mm -hmm. is a, it's a hiring platform for creative professionals. Companies often struggle with finding creative professionals. This was uh, probably eight, seven, seven years ago. Yeah. And at that time uh, LinkedIn was very text-based, mm -hmm. and so the, the thesis was, the hypothesis was, um, how can you hire a creative professional on a text-based mm -hmm. hiring platform? Creative professionals need to upload images, mm -hmm. they need to show their portfolio, LinkedIn wasn't, so again, it's the underserved market. Right. In this world of hiring, who is being underserved in that sense was creative professionals. So we created this hiring platform um, uh, for creative professionals. Mm -hmm. um, our primary users at that time was ad agencies who mm -hmm. were looking for creative directors and art directors, yeah. uh, and they couldn't use LinkedIn because yeah. it was all text. They wanted yeah. to see their work. They wanted to see the, the ads that they had created in their previous job and so forth. So we created that business. Um, and so it was, it was funny because that seemed like the beginning of a great tech mm -hmm. Uh, and then about a year in, I think LinkedIn launched the image upload feature, <laughs> okay. and that was it. That yeah. was the entire yeah. business. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> that was a fascinating experience yeah. too, which is, you know, you just never know what these big companies are going to do. Mm -hmm. And if you're building your business on something that one feature could mm -hmm. change, mm -hmm. it's a bad, well, not a bad business, but there's limitations. Right. Um, and in retrospect, what we should have seen from a mile away is, of course, LinkedIn was going to build an image. <laughs> uh, and that's that's that was an interesting lesson too. Is that there's a lot of obvious features that you could think about. Okay, what's Facebook going to build mm -hmm. next? What's LinkedIn going to build next? And there are these obvious pockets. Mm -hmm. And building a business in that pocket is mm -hmm. generally not that smart. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it took us a year to kind of learn that lesson. Yeah. But it was it was an interesting time. Uh, another key lesson that I learned there is that have you guys had experience fundraising and, and uh, raising money from investors? Okay, so uh, you obviously have heard about it a lot, and I think so much of investment is there. These gurus that know so much about business and they know so much more than us. So if they think our business is good, it must be good. If they think it's bad, it's bad. Uh, investors were lining up to invest in this pretty stupid idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were like, yeah, LinkedIn is text, and you guys are not text, so mm -hmm. take it our money. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we had, and I think we almost like kind of bought into that. So oh. we did, we, I think in isolation, we would have seen that in advance, but we didn't because these investors were saying, yeah, I think you guys are onto something. Uh, this is a really interesting idea. And then we started believing in yeah. the potential of the opportunity. And so we started <coughs> continuing building. Um, and I think even after LinkedIn launched that feature, we continued to work for a while. Mm -hmm. so it was like, oh, you guys are you guys are smart. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a, a really interesting and crucial lesson, which is if and when you do go raise money, um, whether they say your business is bad or whether they say your business is good, they just don't know. They're mm -hmm. investors, and if they knew, they'd probably be Warren Buffett or something. Uh, and so don't take 
other people's thoughts on your startup that seriously. There's going to be lots of different opinions out there. Um, and it's dangerous to listen to people who think your idea is good, but mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. It's also dangerous to listen to people who think your idea is bad, but it's actually good. Uh, so that was the lesson there. But I assume your question would be, what's the next coming? That is the next question, yes. <laughs> You're very well spot. prepared. No, <laughs> <is spot two. laughs> um, so, I guess so you find your founders, co-founders, which is very important. Yes. Actually, this may be the best uh, best scenario of yes. all of this, right? So this is the how long is the next three six uh, program? So the next three six program is kind of interesting. So if anyone's considering, like, oh, should I join this startup accelerator startup program? Um, generally, I recommend it depending on the time commitment. Mm -hmm. For the next three six, it was a six month program where you had to live together with your cohort for three months. Mm. That to me was fascinating. I went to school at SFU Surrey, so I never had this like dormitory mm. experience. And I was like, oh, I get to live with a bunch of people my age uh, for three months. That seemed like a cool idea. Have you guys lived in dorm? Crazy, right? <laughs> Anyways, I only had that for three months, but like, yeah. There was another entrepreneur that was like a part-time DJ who was just mm. pumping music. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's what I signed up for. Yeah. Yeah. He works at Spotify now. So. Oh, that's <laughs> cool. That's pretty cool. Um, so I thought that was a good experience because uh, you guys probably have, um, and we just had a conversation about this too, is how do you find a co-founder? How do you find mm -hmm. a technical co-founder? Uh, a lot of times I find is you really have to step out of your normal day-to-day -day routine. Coming to events like this is a great example. For me, I had to fly to Toronto to participate in a program to meet my co-founders who are from Calgary. And so I really had to step outside of my zone. Uh, and the way I think about it is, if you stay within your zone and you've been walking that path for your whole life and you haven't met your co-founder yet, then what's changing? Mm -hmm. um, so travel is a piece of that, applying to programs is a piece of that. Uh, and programs like Next36 exist to connect people to different co-founders. Yeah. And so that's how I think. That's good. I think Lix 36 kind of expand to more programs now. They're, they're, they're Lix Canada where they have program for AI, program yeah. for founders too. So it's a it's good, good organization that's doing good things for, for the start ecosystem. It is. And, and it was, I think it was free. Um, like I had to pay for food and stuff like that. Right? Uh, so it was free, it was six months of my time. I was going through school at the time. I wasn't really missing out on much. I was, uh, it had been a while since I've been running Witty Cookie and I was frustrated at how like, I wanted to build something bigger and there was all these limitations around the, the website model. Um, so I had very little to lose. Yeah. And then when I met my co-founder, I still consider that to be a life-changing moment Yeah. because it defines so much of what I worked on afterwards. Did Nick stick equity or is basically a Equity. I can't remember exactly how much, um, and they've probably changed over the past seven yeah. years or so. Um, but when I looked at it, I was like, okay, well, I haven't built anything yet, yeah. so the value of this business is zero. Yeah. And they wanted equity in something that didn't exist yet. So and they pay you for that? Uh, they invest in the company. Yeah, they, yeah, 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 they invest the in the company. Yeah. Uh, I think it was maybe $100,000? $80,000. 80000 I checked contracts. Okay. <laughs> I didn't buy from <laughs> Um, Maybe last I, do you know if it was back then? Because I know they changed it. They changed a little bit. So last, um, actually a few months ago, they went to UBC to actually pitch oh, the okay. students. I, I think they updated to a little bit more than that. Yeah, they so, changed that amount. Yeah. But yeah. that's generally how these startup programs work yeah. sometimes, is yeah. they'll invest for equity. Um, so for me, it was a good deal. Because, yeah. okay, it's hundred or $80,000, yeah. whatever it was at the time, for equity of a company that didn't mm -hmm. So they did have equity in Needle HR. Yeah. Uh, higher, um, of course, they don't have equity on any of the projects that yeah. started afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was great. But they, they gave you the opportunity to have founders, yes. co founders, which yes. is pretty, pretty much more valuable than whatever money they yes. give you. Because yeah. you, you keep with the, the team. Yeah, I stay with them. You stay with them. Yeah. So, so next on, you, you, you start something new. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, shortly after next, and I often forget about this business, but uh, mm. when I go through chronologically, that, that's why I remember. Um, for a brief period of time, we started a company called Cover FM, mm. um, and so Needle was in this interesting space where like yeah, people used it, but not really, and there's this long delay because they're looking for talent. You don't know whether or not they actually hired them. Mm. Uh, Cover FM was this, it was a music discovery, talent discovery mm. platform. You can probably tell by the description that it probably didn't go very well. Very tough business. Mm. Um, and it was it was this idea that using covers, and covers are mm. popular on YouTube, you guys probably heard covers before. This was around the time where a lot of these cover bands, um, you guys can probably name some of them like on YouTube. I don't know who they are now. At mm -hmm. the time, there was like Voice Avenue and stuff like that. 
Uh, so we wanted to build an entire platform uh, for discovering those artists. Mm. And how it works is you type a song and it would compile a playlist of mm -hmm. covers of that song. Uh -huh. And it was addressing that this is like a very, very niche, underserved market, yeah. which is if you really like a song but you don't want to listen to the same Just, yeah. person singing that song, <laughs> yeah. it helps you build this playlist. Yeah. Um, and 500,000 people use it every wow. month. Wow. Uh, and so the, the magic of underserved market is like, I was just like, I thought I was weird because I loved doing that. <laughs> so you know say small people like, yeah, I was like, I like the song, but I also want to hear it on acoustic yeah. and then a harp and then flutes. Uh, and I was like, I don't know how many people there are. And, yeah. then, and then it turns out that a lot of people wanted mm -hmm. to do it. We started doing partnerships with artists. Yeah. So artists, um, Mo do you guys know Moby? You guys know Moby, okay. Wow. Uh, Moby's uh, from a while back. Um, so anyways, uh, so we have these collaboration opportunities where artists would drop new songs uh, and host music challenges to create covers of that song as a strategy to promote their music. So you get all these cover artists who are emerging artists who also want exposure for their own music. Um, and so I couldn't have foreseen any of that. It was just like I wanted to listen to the same song and these different instruments. Um, what has changed though is with technical co-founders, now I can create a technical solution. This is a digital platform where it actually works. It wasn't just a, a service where mm -hmm. I'm going to go hire a person and right. play a harp for you yeah. in a song. Um, and so that was also a fascinating experience and building a product that people actually loved and, and working with partnerships and artists and developing new business models. Uh, ultimately, that didn't work out because of the limitations of the market. It's just, mm -hmm. Music is very tough. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, like, if you like the song and you bought it on iTunes, I mean, you get, like, a cent. Oh, okay. uh, They get, like, a, a dollar or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and so, even with hundreds of thousands of users, I it's think still much. there is an article on the Globe and Mail that says, yeah. uh, after making eight cents, this company pivoted away. Yeah. So, <laughs> we made eight cents before yeah. we are like, yeah. something's not right. It's just false or something. Oh, it's still, oh, yes. <laughs> I did my homework on this. I know a little bit more than you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my co founders yeah. took a lot yeah, of they took, Yes, yes, they did tell you the post style. Yeah, it was just extended. You should look into that. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them for the $11. Anyway, so this is actually another lesson where you, you actually went to an industry where it's completely new from your experience. Like, Mm -hmm. Music industry is still in it. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because music industry is an industry, but as a music consumer, we're all music consumers. Mm -hmm. So when looking at a business, let's say you want to build a business in music, you don't necessarily have to know the music industry. Mm -hmm. If you are a, an avid music listener, mm -hmm. you can still build solutions for other avid music listeners. Um, so it's just it's the way in which you think about business, and the way I approach business is very simplistic. Mm -hmm. uh, like. Even like Elon Musk's premises are quite simple. It's just like, let's go to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> so the best businesses are, are simple. Uh, mm -hmm. And cover was very simple. It's just you want to hear one song, but you want to hear different people yeah. sing. And I think those tend to be the, the best starting points. Um, when I talk to early stage entrepreneurs and, and aspiring founders, a lot of times they, they're overthinking the problem. They're like, okay, what's well, business model? What is this going to be? Yeah. What if so-and-so does this uh, tomorrow? Um, but those thoughts result in choice paralysis. Mm -hmm. and so you don't end up doing anything. Um, and for me, the first step is always the most important because the first step is just addressing a very small problem mm -hmm. in a very small market. But things just happen. Like I didn't, I don't know, I didn't know Moby. Moby contacted us, <laughs> and then I found out. Okay, he's an artist that used to be really big. Um, and so it was Moby's team who created this idea. Oh. His, his marketing team was like, "Hey, Moby's uh, doing a new album. Yeah. Um, we're looking for opportunities to host these music contests, yeah. and we saw that you have this yeah. platform." And so. In that specific scenario, all I did was create a valuable experience for some people, and the business model actually came to us. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's what I described to be the importance of taking the first step. Yeah. Is when you don't take any steps, even if the business model wants to come to you, you're not in the market. Yeah. Once you have the first step, things start to happen. Yeah. So twelve dollars doesn't really cover the expense that you know, whatever I'm investment very that you guys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need very little. So you move on to another project, another yeah. idea. Yeah. On that note, though, I, I do think it, it is important. Yes. Yeah. For a long time, uh, I just I ate very little, and that made a big difference. Mm. Um, and so like my your standards burn, of living, of your burn, my burn rate was low. low. My yes. calorie burn yeah. rate was low. <laughs> yes. um, so I think you know reducing living expenditures was important for mm -hmm. me in the earlier stages. Um, so when you hear about like oh you should, I always recommend start companies early and start companies young because once you have family and kids, you yeah, can't just make twelve dollars. 
<laughs> when I mean twelve dollars, we like we had a party. Yeah. And we had... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that was important to me. Um, and you know, for a long time, while my friends moved out and had like nice uh, apartments and homes, uh, I just lived at home. Mm -hmm. you know, that was fine. So I went many years without making money, without getting paid, yeah. uh, and that was okay. And I think that was important because if I needed money, I might not have been able to take risks. Mm -hmm. That's something to think about. Yeah. What are your living expenses? How important? How tied are you to your lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And are you willing to give some of that stuff up if you want to get yeah, some form of business? That's, that's good. This and that's the middle. Yeah, yeah. Keep it going. Yeah. yeah. I still got camera and pasta. Yeah. So, what's the next project for you? So, uh, after Cover FM, um, we we built Snipply, which is yeah. which is. Uh, I guess two dates would be one of the most successful companies that I've started, and this was like my 12th attempt at that company. Um, and so a lot of times, like in the media and the press, and I guess you've done all your research. I did a little bit. The media always sounds like Michael started a company yesterday and now it's sold. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like my 13, 14 attempts after 10 years of not eating food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the part that yeah. gets missed a lot. And that's why I always try to make time to come to this type of stuff and demystify it a little bit. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not easy, it doesn't happen overnight, um, and it's not its not started by geniuses like, like Elon Musk, I should say, a genius, but it's just like normal people who just commit to doing this one thing and did it for 12 years mm -hmm. and then, you know, had, a, had their success. And so I think that's important to know as an entrepreneur, um, just knowing that like every business is started by people just like you, um, and really it's just people who are who didn't give up and just like kept going even though they were making twelve dollars. Yeah. So, so the next company was Snipply, uh, and and with Snipply we had we had learned enough by that time that we're like okay this there needs to be revenue generating opportunities this needs to be useful this needs to be unique it needs to go after an underserved market so all these lessons mm -hmm. stack and layer um, and so that's been the fascinating part of my career is just like every business is slightly larger than the next business mm -hmm. uh, and it's because I keep learning these lessons they're always different and. You, you, you avoid those mistakes that you encounter new yeah. ones, but over time you you know a lot, mm -hmm. and so you, you start to avoid all of the obvious ones. Um, so with Snipply, we knew we didn't want to target consumers. That was a big, important decision mm -hmm. for us. That, that, that isn't to say that uh, consumer isn't a great opportunity. Like I'm wearing these Bestie shoes, they're a good friend of mine. I was just talking to Sam earlier. Yeah, okay, yeah. they're consumer facing. Yeah. They do really well. Yeah. Um, so. So what, what's important though is you need to know what you're good at. I'm not good at consumer facing businesses. Mm -hmm. So that, we start to craft these criteria for what this business is gonna be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't come from a business background, so mm -hmm. we're not gonna go after air sales. Yeah. So by process of elimination, we start to come together to be, mm -hmm. uh, who are we building for? So that's, uh, that was a new way of thinking. Who are we building for? Starting from there, and then working your way backwards. Yeah. Uh, now that you know who you're building for, you can talk to them, you can ask them, what does your day-to-day -day look like? What are some of the challenges that you have? And then start to identify opportunities. So it was the first time in, in my career at that time to take that approach. Yeah. Pick the clients yeah. first and then build business. Um, so what we arrived at was we wanted a small, medium-sized business that is relatively fast-moving, and then it was the, the social media marketing. Mm. And it was, it was very specific. It's like a, the social media marketing, which this uh, six, Five years ago or so, mm -hmm. uh, was still like a rising yeah. like social media market yeah. was very very hot, um, and so we wanted to build for that space. Um, and so we started talking to them and just like identify what is it, what do you, what do you struggle with? And specifically, content curation was mm -hmm. now we're getting like very yeah. specific. Uh, you don't have to understand the specifics of it, um, but understand the kind of the general idea of picking a, a market and getting to know them so well that. You can start to speak in jargon mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that um, other people don't necessarily understand or grasp, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing because that means your solution is solving a very specific problem. Yeah. And we go back to that underserved market. So um, the statement that we ended up with was, "What if you could put an ad on any page on the mm -hmm. web?" And that was that was really the statement that we started off. Uh, so we like these when when conceptualizing new ideas. We like these "what if" statements. So just asking ourselves and then asking our target customers. What if? Mm -hmm. So when we asked, what if you could put your ad on any website without paying anything, without paying uh, ad dollars? 
Uh, we were like, yeah, that would be really cool. So we told people, what if we could put your ad on any website without paying anyone? And they were like, yeah, of course. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so, so, you know, that approach of building business and coming up with an idea is kind of like Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. What if we could go to the moon? Yeah. And then working your way backwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we start with electric cars, and then we send the car to space. And then, <laughs> yeah. So, so that worked really well for us. Uh, and then the, the hard part. Mm -hmm. like, okay. Yeah. We've got a bunch of people to say that they would put their ads on any page without yeah. paying anything. And how do you do it? How do you do that? <laughs> um, so that was a great technical challenge, uh, but it's a very solvable challenge. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up figuring out is, is anybody web developers here or technical leading? Anyone know what an iframe is? No, I don't know that. Okay. So um, what we ended up doing was we, we found out that you can put an ad on any page through a technology called iframe. Mm -hmm. And an iframe is it displays a page, but it overlays something on top. Mm -hmm. And so what we were able to do is we could display an iframe, play the page in the underlying part of that iframe, and overlay something on top. But that can only exist through a unique URL that we create for the users. Mm -hmm. So instead of, um, you know, you go to New York Times and you mm -hmm. see an ad, that, that is illegal yeah. and not possible. We can't, you know, that would be hacking. Um, what we created was you can create a unique URL on our website yeah. and you can direct that link to go to New York Times. And when you click through that link, you will see New York Times with your ad there. Yeah. Um, so that was, we, we had solved that mm -hmm. problem to some degree. It wasn't in its true execution, mm -hmm. but we fulfilled the yeah, premise. It worked. And so we went back and we said, hey, you said you wanted to put mm -hmm. your ad on every website. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Yeah. The only limitation is people have to go through this link. Yeah. And what people said was, that's fine. Yeah. We'll use it. Yeah. That was good enough. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we got our first 100,000 and then 10,000. Yeah. And eventually, um, it's still operating today. Yeah. It's five, 550,000. I was just using it today. Great. Wow, you really. Yeah. It works. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brilliant idea, actually. Yeah. Because for a lot of people or a lot of company, content creation yes. is a, if a, it's a really big problem because yeah. they don't have the resources to do all this. Yeah. So curating someone else's uh, content and then share it to the target audience works the same. Yeah. 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 So it's a brilliant idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so what was interesting about that business is, as you can imagine, there's some concerns. Like, you're putting things on other people's website. How does New York Times feel about it? How do mm -hmm. other people feel about it? Uh, and if we had thought about that too much, maybe mm -hmm. we wouldn't have done mm -hmm. it. Uh, but we, what has worked well for us in the past is just like, hey, build it. There's some people who like it. Let's figure out the challenges later. Yeah. So what we ended up realizing was people actually wanted it. They appreciated it. Mm -hmm. When you put your thing on somebody else's page and you share that link, you're actually driving traffic to their content yeah. that they're creating. And content creators struggle the most with getting traffic mm -hmm. to their sites. Um, and so we were able to leverage this whole community of content curators and link sharers to drive traffic to the people who create the content and created the symbiotic relationship where mm -hmm. both parties benefit. Yeah. So you were saying you used it earlier. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what page you shared it on? Uh, I'll share it on our social media. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, and what was the link? Where was the link going? To? It was going to like a launch academy. Yeah. Event. Exactly. I was just sharing it, like it's like a startup event. Yeah. yeah. I just shared it to our social media. And then uh, you added like I a added like call call back to action join our chapter. Yeah. So so, it so, works. <laughs> so that's how it works, right? Yeah. It's, it's you know you wouldn't have shared a link to launch academy were it not for the opportunity to tell people who are visiting launch academy to come. Yeah. To, to this, <laughs> and, so, so um, and so that's that's kind of the idea. But again, it's like we couldn't have seen all of that up front. Uh, I, I would assume there could be some entrepreneurial geniuses who can consider all these possibilities, but really it was taking the first step, uh, finding that underserved market, starting to build for them, and then just letting things happen, letting the business model come to you, letting these opportunities come to you. So uh, that worked out well. So what kind of business model do you start this idea with? Yeah, so uh, software as a service around that time was starting to become really popular. And this is the idea that cloud-based software can be charged for a monthly recurring price. Um, and uh, we have a free plan mm -hmm. and people could just use it for free. When there is enough traffic through their links, we ask them to pay and it was like 20, $20 a month or something like that. Uh, so that's what it started by, and then over time we started to add more features and more plans, and it was $100 a month and then $200 a month, um, and then it just expanded from there. Yeah. And then what are the initial, like the first hundred or so kinds of customers? Um, it was people like you. It was uh -huh. just like people were promoting events and people were 
kind of uh, not necessarily big companies, just people mm -hmm. who are part time doing yeah. their own things. Um, maybe they wanted to send traffic to. I don't even know if Shopify was a thing mm -hmm. at the time. I don't know Kickstarter was. What a lot year of was that? It's two thousand thirteen. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's pretty early, early stage. I don't think it's five. I think Kickstarter was. Kickstarter around. was on. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a very popular use case in the early days. Is uh, by definition, if you are on Kickstarter, you don't have your own website, you don't have your own blog, but you still want to promote your Kickstarter. Um, and so companies like Vessi, now they didn't exist back then, but they would share articles about, oh, it's going to rain today. Mm -hmm. And with a callback, that's yeah. like, oh, buy us. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that was the early users. And then we started expanding into businesses and eventually had users like Oracle or Dell or Salesforce. And yeah. They have the very much uh, same needs. They're also sharing content. They yeah. want to raise awareness to their events and their uh -huh. So did you have outside sales to have outbound sales to have reach them or or are you like it was how did you find your customers this time? Yeah, so it was um, again we didn't plan it, mm. but what we realized was when you make people share a very specific link and that link is snip dot mm -hmm. everyone is exposed to a ah. product just by so when you share wow. that wow. Fact, you right? just helped ah, Yes, yes, yes. Very <laughs> smart, very smart. Uh, and so that's how it worked. Um, so in retrospect, what we had cracked is this idea of a viral loop, or yeah. acquisition loop, some yeah. people call it, is with every person who uses the product, more people mm. are exposed to the product yeah. and therefore drive more users. Mm. So when you share that article, yeah. somebody who clicked on it, yeah. Uh, let's say a thousand people clicked on it and it's Launch Academy link. Yeah. Some of them go to you, some of them will be like, whoa, how did he do that? Yeah. So they go how, to did you, you, yeah. how did you add that link yeah. on this page? Yeah. Because they know you are not Launch Academy. Mm -hmm. How did they do it? They discover Snipply because of the URL. Everyone's sharing these yeah. URLs. Um, and then they then discover it. And so we didn't need an outside sales. Mm -hmm. So those are another really cool lesson there is just when thinking about idea and conceptualization, people often get tripped up about distribution. How do I build a sales team to expose my product and my service to all these big people? Do I need a lot of funding? But if you can figure out things like viral loops and acquisition loops and thinking about how one customer can lead to multiple customers, mm -hmm. um, that's how you can bypass the need for yeah. having an outside sales team. Yeah. So it's basically they come to you. Exactly. Then how do you serve them? And how do you start to see, oh, I find for the market fit I'm serving more than I can have, have served. So the, the beauty of building technical products is you can always serve. Mm -hmm. uh, the only limitation is just data. And yeah. That's more or less limitless. So we even at 550,000 customers, we're never, not even close to not being able to serve. Mm -hmm. It's a technical product, it's digital. Mm -hmm. if, a, if a million people start to, actually, let me, there's an exception to that. Okay. We learned a lesson, which mm -hmm. is Justin Bieber used it once. Oh, and that crashed us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. Justin Bieber had done an interview with Scooter yeah. Braun yeah. and uh, tweeted the snippet, oh. and that drove I think 23 million people oh. to our servers <laughs> at once. Oh. So you that, found your limitation. I found <laughs> Justin Bieber. Yes. <laughs> So there are limitations, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's it's an outlier. Yeah. Uh, but that, that was a great lesson too, yeah. because then we knew, okay, we need to improve our yeah. infrastructure. We started to build localized servers so that if you're in Asia, it will pull the link from an Asian server yeah. instead of coming back to North America. Yeah. Um, so yes, I guess there are limitations. So this company, you eventually go it, go it, and kind of sell it. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that part of the story is a little, a little bit complex. Um, about three years ago, we were looking at Snipply, which at the time was uh, uh, 400,000 users yeah. or so. Uh, we really asked ourselves, is this going to be a billion dollar company? Mm -hmm. And the answer really was, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think we could have built a hundred million dollar company, um, but we had spent three years building it. And we were like, okay, if this is not going to be our billion dollar company, then let's move on. Yep. Uh, and I think that, that's a, it's a difficult decision that you have to make as an entrepreneur is it's good to never give up. Mm -hmm. But it's also smart sometimes to mm -hmm. pull a plug and work on something else. So we have thought about how do we pivot, how do we move it to a bigger opportunity? Because at the end of the day, link sharing, content sharing, it's not that big. Mm -hmm. It's a big market, but it's not that big. Uh, and so we started brainstorming ideas around what can we build that's actually bigger? What's mm -hmm. the trend these days? Uh, when we had built Snipply, social media marketing had kind of, the hype had kind of died, and mm -hmm. so it's, people have kind of figured out social media marketing by then. 
Um, so we started looking for trends, and it was another exercise of how do you come up with a good concept, with a good idea, and it's always adding another layer of criteria. So this time we're like, okay, we know we can sell to small, medium-sized marketers, mm -hmm. we know we want a freemium product, we know we want it to have a viral loop, we know we don't want an enterprise sales component to it, we know we want to charge monthly, so all these criteria start to combine. Mm -hmm. The one criteria we added was, okay, is it a billion dollar opportunity? Mm -hmm. And so we started looking at world trends. And with Lumen 5, that's the approach we took. What are the biggest things that are happening in the world right now? And what can we realistically tie back to these other criteria? Um, so, I mean, there's lots of major trends that I can't, like, cure for cancer, great, but I can't do that. It's not within my skill set. Um, what we noticed in our specific space, because we knew we wanted to build for marketers, was video. Video was this thing that was um, three years ago on the rise and now is still growing faster mm -hmm. than ever before. You go on Facebook, you go on Instagram, there's just videos everywhere, mm -hmm. YouTube and, and so forth. Um, and this, what we, what we knew was people are watching videos because we're carrying mini televisions around with us. Data plans are now affordable enough to watch videos. So the, the, our audience, the marketers, knew they wanted to make more videos. Mm -hmm. And that's where we found the problem, is they don't know how to make videos. They don't have money to go out there and hire these professional video teams. Uh, and that was the premise. Yeah. The premise is similar to Snipply, which is like, what if? We said, what if you could make videos with the click of a button? Mm. Just one click, we'll figure out yeah. like, what if you could do that. Yeah. Uh, and it was the same as Snipply. They said, yeah, if I could make videos with the click of a button, I would make videos all day long. Yeah. Uh, and then we went to the drawing board, went to the whiteboard. What, what do we figure out? How mm. do we allow this to happen? Um, so video, have you guys done any video editing or video creation before? Great, it's complex, right? You probably use After Effects or there's layers and timelines, all very hard. Uh, so how then do we create a video with a single click? Uh, the idea that we eventually came up with was creating something out of nothing is very hard, but if we create something out of something else, mm -hmm. that's possible. Yeah. And the, what that idea ended up becoming is we can turn a blog post into a video. So give us a blog post, we'll take bits and pieces of text will overlay it. Mm -hmm. And that forms a lot of the videos that you probably see today, like from Daily Hive or Forbes mm -hmm. or Economist. Um, those are all of our customers. So those videos that you see were created by uh, the Lumen 5 technology. And uh, the value proposition for them is they've written all these articles yeah. and continue to write all these blog posts. Using our system, uh, it turns it into a video. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot of technical considerations in there, like we partnered with Getty and Shutterstock mm -hmm. to find stock videos and stock photos. Yeah. And you combine them. Uh, we have AI and natural language processing for the summarization aspects. So uh, we've been operating that business for about two and a half years and that the product has become much more sophisticated since. Mm -hmm. But it really started off with this basic idea. What if you could create videos with a single button? Mm -hmm. How would we go about doing that? Um, blog to video being the basis. How do we expand on that? So it was a very similar story, except this time it grew much faster mm -hmm. because video is much harder, the market is bigger. Uh, we always, uh, even in this talk, talk about underserved market. But in this case, the underserved market was very large. Mm -hmm. It was a large portion of the, of the market that was underserved. Um, and so it grew, I think, six or seven times mm -hmm. faster than Snippy in the earlier days. Um, and so when we started to see that growth curve, Snippy was still low. Mm -hmm. And we decided to start talking to potential buyers. Yeah. Who are these people who want to buy the business? And um, this is, I hope, something that everyone here can experience. The selling of a business is very exciting. And it's, it's like everything else. It's just a sales process. It's going out there, pitching to people what your business is all about, trying to convince them that the economics makes sense to buy it. And then eventually, um, we came to an agreement with Tim Schumacher, who is the uh, founder of Adblock Plus, uh, for synergies around Stiply, which is really around putting ads on pages. And they're Adblocks. <laughs> So they're blocking someone else right, and then serving the. Yeah. So it's, it's not for them. But they also they know that market very well. So. Yeah. yeah. So so that's a good good story for both uh, yeah. both the buyer and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you guys can focus on Lumen Five because you you were doing both parallel for a little for while. a little while. Yeah, and that was tough. Building two businesses is not something that I recommend. Um, and that was a lesson that uh, I learned relatively recently in the past, I guess, six years is. I, there were points in time where I would run multiple businesses mm -hmm. simultaneously. It's generally not a good idea. Um, and it was, it's just, it takes so much energy to build one business mm -hmm. that building two businesses becomes close to impossible. Mm -hmm. And three is even more difficult. Now, again, there are exceptions. Elon Musk is mm -hmm. the CEO of two publicly yeah. traded companies. Yeah. 
but even he is able to intertwine them. Like, okay, let's put a car on a rocket and set it up, and then both of his yeah. stocks. <laughs> but there are ways to do it, but it's something that's highly challenging, and I really don't recommend. Yeah. So how did you kind of, you know, do it parallel at that time to make both kind of still going? Because you have to grow yeah. both businesses. I think. Um, Working on it in parallel is probably an overstatement. It was more so we had spent all of our time on Lumen 5 uh -huh. and simply was mostly neglected uh, because we know focus is important. Yeah. We decided to focus um, on Lumen 5. Uh, that means that the customers weren't getting, getting as good of experience, the product wasn't moving as quickly mm -hmm. as it once was. Uh, but that's also why we knew it was time to sell mm -hmm. the business. We were not giving it the attention that yeah. it deserves and requires. We owe it to our customers to deliver good service and good product, and selling it to somebody who will focus mm -hmm. on it is a much better outcome for everyone. How big was the team uh, back then when you were doing part of like Or simply it was just four people. Oh, yeah. And it was because it was the viral yeah. and it was all yeah. inbound. Yeah. We didn't so you don't, don't yeah. Everything is pretty much self -serve. Yeah. So you don't need That's people right. to serve them. Yeah. They have questions for you guys. Yeah. Answer yeah. them. That's right. All the founders, co-founders answer the... Uh, uh, just me. Just you? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, that's cool. So then you move on to Lumen 5, uh, Lumen 5 and then Lumen 5 you know, continue to grow. Yeah, yeah. So another criteria that we added onto Lumen 5 was simply was a, it was a very profitable business because it was just four people mm -hmm. and everything was automated and inbound. Uh, with Lumen 5, because we wanted to build something much bigger, there was an explicit intention to hire once we once we make money, hire someone. Once we make money, hire yeah. someone. So we operated simply for about three years, four people. Lumen 5, about two years in, we're at 26 people now. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different way to build the business. Yeah. And I'm sure uh, whatever we're doing now, I'm probably making a lot of mistakes that if, you, if we talk again two years from now, I'll tell you, well, that didn't make sense. Uh, but that's part of it. Yeah. I'll book you two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, this is a good lesson. So I'm glad now this time you want to go faster. Yes. So that's why you build a team much bigger now. Yeah. So what we learned from Snipply was we were limited by how good we were. Mm -hmm. um, and so as much as we tried to learn and grow personally, as engineers, as product designers, as sales and marketing people, our growth was capped at how fast we could grow. Mm -hmm. um, with Lumen 5, there's a very explicit intention to hire people so much smarter than ourselves. And so the, the ceiling keeps getting pushed forward. Yeah. We're hiring engineers that are way smarter than us, product designers that are way better than us, um, and you really see the return. And I think that's why Lumen 5 is growing so much faster, is when you bring in smart people, they do good work. Yeah. And they tend to attract other smart people, yeah. and they do even better work. When do you start to hire that first, um, the fifth, so to speak? Yeah, um, it, was, it was when we first made enough money um, to afford the salary. To afford the salary yeah. That's right. And I think the first hire was tough because we hired the AI engineer. Uh -huh. And they're like one of the most expensive jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was our first hire because it was our weak point. Mm -hmm. And AI isn't something you can just be like, oh, yeah. I'm just going to go learn. Yeah. Uh, so that one. I mean, it didn't take that long, and I think it was because Lumen Cloud was picking up traction very mm -hmm. quickly, so we generated revenue, I think, by maybe month six mm -hmm. or so. Yeah, so you got enough yeah. money to have afford the salary right. and then you attract them. So this is still a relatively new startup mm -hmm. back then, even if you find comes to yeah. this traction, how do you attract that fifth, you know, fifth? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I ask him to this yeah, day what yeah. he saw in us. Um, but I think that is what startup hiring is all about: is you're looking for employees who are highly entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. They want to be part of this all or nothing. They want to take this big risk with you. There are lots of people in the city and beyond who wants, who doesn't want to work in as one of ten thousand at Amazon. Uh, a lot of people find it somewhat discouraging to know that they're working on this one button mm -hmm. in Amazon. Um, so I think a lot of people were drawn to this opportunity to be employee number one, yep. to build everything with the founders from ground up. Um, and for a lot of aspiring founders, that's often the first step. Is they want to start their own company, they don't quite know how to do it, and they want to watch it happen from the front line so that they apply mm -hmm. as employee number one to see companies grow up. So I wouldn't worry about not being able to attract talent mm -hmm. as an early stage company. Yeah. Um, the types of talent you have access to changes over time depending on the size of your company. So in the very early stage, mm -hmm. you have access to these highly entrepreneurial talent. Mm -hmm. 
And then in your middle stage, you have access to people who are maybe a bit more established in their career. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's an evolving spectrum. At our current stage, we no longer have access to that early stage talent mm -hmm. because those people want to be employee number one. They don't want to be now. they don't yeah. want to be twenty seven. Yeah. But there are people who would love to be number mm -hmm. twenty seven. Yeah. So there's always a talent pool for every stage of this. Yeah. So you just pop into the at the right stage where yes. you find the right stage. That's right. Employees. That's good. So eventually you go to 27 now, 26, 27 now. What kind of roles, I know you're, you're still high and right? you're still going very fast. What kind of roles are you looking for and what, what kind of roles do you think? Or looking back, what kind of hiring order in terms of building the team do you think you, you should be doing as yeah. you grow your business? I, I, I'll go back to my earlier point of a business is a function of the co-founder. So it's, it becomes a combination of your strengths and weaknesses. And that part is important strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. The business will inherit the weaknesses of the co-founders. Um, and so the hiring roadmap is different from company to company because the composition of the founders mm -hmm. is different. Um, so I get asked that question a lot, which is like, mm -hmm. oh, give me the hiring yeah. roadmap and I'll follow it. Yeah. But it doesn't, doesn't work. work. Yeah. You have to hire, you have to know what you're weak at. For us, AI was critical to the success of our idea. We didn't have AI expertise in-house, so that was hire number mm -hmm. one. Um, and the first few hires were all engineers. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until later that we started bringing sales and marketing talent. Yeah. Um, so it requires a, a great deal of self-awareness as well, as you have to be able to look yourself and your co-founders in the mirror and say, like, what are you not good at? What am I not good at? And who do we need to hire for? Um, some of the founders you'll see that continue to make no progress are people who are not aware of their own flaws and are not hiring to fill those flaws and therefore continue to hit that same flaw again mm -hmm. and again. So the hiring roadmap is entirely dependent on your strengths and weaknesses. It's definitely worthwhile to get together with your partners and just write it out. Mm -hmm. What are the strengths of you, you, you? What are they combined? What are the weaknesses? The strengths are where you want to spend most of your time. The weaknesses are where you want to hire. Yeah. So you've been you you know been with the same team basically co-founding team for how many startups? Six, now? seven years. Um, one, two, three, four. Four startups now. It's basically the same same core team. So how do you you know you guys know each other pretty well by now, and it's, you guys know yeah, all you know all the. It's interesting so. because when you work together with someone long enough, yeah. Uh, they change too, right? Mm -hmm. We all change as people as a result of uh, our different life experiences. So it's not like I know them so well. Mm -hmm. They're all they're also yeah. changing, and, uh, and it's always continuing to get to know each other. And I always draw this comparison, which is like co-founders are just like dating. It's like you, you don't just meet and then stop mm -hmm. that effort. Uh, and it's always an active effort of communication. Uh, and every problem you can name in a marriage is probably there in yeah. a co-founder relationship. And if you don't resolve those conflicts. You don't have open and candid conversations about it. That explodes, yeah. just like with any other relationship. Yeah, because one of the biggest, uh, you know, number one killer of startup is yes. the co-founder infighting. Right? Yes. So right. how do you guys kind of fix that problem or how? Yeah. Face that challenge. So uh, I'll definitely say that like time doesn't isn't necessarily the solution. Like you said, I've worked with them for a long time, but still, there's a lot of active mm -hmm. effort. Um, as companies grow bigger, the stakes are higher, the conflicts get, get more heated, there's more arguing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just taking time. Like I think uh, this was like last year, I took a walk along the seawall with one of my co-founders mm -hmm. and we just walked around for four hours, I mm -hmm. think, until we like our feet was not good. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that. It's like talk through all the conflicts that we've had over the past yeah. three months. What do you believe? What don't you believe? Do you still believe in this business? Why? Why not? And so it's that open communication that you consider to continue to align and make sure you're both going for the same things. Uh, but it's an ongoing effort, and communication is the key, just like anything else. That's good. So Lumen Five won the New Venture BC competition last year. What is the experience like? Uh, you know, going through all those different stages of the, the competition. Yeah, that, that was really fascinating. So. Uh, for those who are not familiar, New Venture BC is, a, I think, British Columbia's largest venture competition. Its, uh, its goal is to find the fastest growing company in British Columbia, so we were very fortunate to have won that. Um, the experience was really interesting because I think when I think about business, um, I don't really think much about the, the press or anything like that. I want to focus mm -hmm. on building the, the product for mm -hmm. the customer. What I've learned through that experience is that the team really appreciates that mm -hmm. type of stuff. To know that they're working for a company mm -hmm. that's being recognized, um, so the key takeaway from that experience, I think, is just everyone in the company was really excited mm -hmm. as we went through round one, round two, round three. Uh, and of the people who were there at the award ceremony, 
eagerly waiting for them to announce the winner. Yeah. Uh, that was a, a moment of team spirit that, that I think was very rewarding for me mm -hmm. as somebody who kind of grew the team from from nobody to 20, 20 odd people to see that they were genuinely excited to, and proud to be part of this company. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking of, of, about nowadays. Um, transitioning, they, they call this the, the kind of founder to executive transition, which is very challenging. And it's one of my great challenges that I can't really speak much to now because this is what I'm going through right now. It's how do you move away from just thinking about customers and value propositions to company culture? How do you create career opportunities for people um, when people come in and join the company, you start to witness all sorts of life events. People get married, they have kids, they buy a dog or a cat. Um, and all of those things are impacting their lifestyle, their expenses, and they look to the opportunities that the company can provide in terms of career ladders and progression. The bonuses start to matter a lot to people. Some people are paycheck to paycheck, some people don't care as much. Um, and so, and kind of, the, the, for the first time, I guess, for so long, I see myself as the co-founder of a company, um, but really for the first time I have to play the CEO of a company, mm -hmm. which is a, a very different skill set, uh, but it's, it's a very rewarding opportunity when done right. That's good. Now, right now it's 26, 27 people now, but it is still like a, a score. Mm -hmm. And the problem with growing team and you need more talent, mm -hmm. and Vancouver is uh, it's getting a lot of tech companies mm -hmm. coming in town and fighting for the yep. same talent pool now. Yep. So what, what is your thought on yeah. that and what, 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 what kind of strategy do you have in retaining your talent and also attracting talent? I get asked that a lot as well. It's like, oh, hey, Amazon's coming, Apple's coming, what, what are you going to do? Um, but I go back to what I said earlier. It's every stage of the company has access to a certain stage of, um, of talent pool. And so there are a group of people who would love to be the first 50 employees at a company that would never ever consider joining Apple or mm -hmm. Amazon or anything like that. Uh, if anything, I welcome that because most, so many people who join the startup world who are super talented are people who have worked in Amazon and Apple and Microsoft who maybe they spent a few years there, they're tired of working on the one button. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the famous story was like the Facebook like button was a a 25 person team that worked on that mm. thumbs up for mm. a year mm. to, to just get the thumb angle <laughs> just right and the sleeve and the yeah. button and so the color, <laughs> and, the color. Um, and now I think they like got rid of it so. Yeah. <laughs> so you know it brings a lot of talent into the city yeah. uh, it introduces a lot of training for talent in the city which I think is really important is you can join a startup but you don't get the same type of training as you would if you get uh, if you work for Apple for a year um, so it actually gives us access to much higher quality and well-trained talent. Um, so I'm not worried at all of anything, I'm very optimistic about it. So what is it like working for Lumen5 now as you go and as you like? Yeah, I don't know if I'm the best person to ask. <laughs> you should probably ask me yeah. on the team. But overall, I think the, the impact is something that you hear about a lot. Mm -hmm. is they can have a meeting in the morning, they can have to change implemented by noon, have to fix push it out by end of day, and then customers see it before the end of the business day. Um, and so this rapid iteration, when compared to something like if you, uh, if you release a new design for Amazon, you might not see it for four months. Um, and so that impact is something that's definitely there. That family-oriented aspect of early stage companies is definitely there. You know everybody, you know their names, you know what they're doing. Um, so I think working on the Five is kind of like any other company, any other startup, that, that family aspect. Uh, the unique aspect, I think, that I've heard from people on the team is just because we create a product that's used by brands that are like Forbes and Daily Hive and TransLink, um, it's a very unique opportunity for their friends and family to know what they're working on. Uh, it's a product that impacts people here in the city, it impacts people around the world, uh, which is not something you always get if you're working on a technical back-end product. Your friends and family don't know what you're working on, they, they don't necessarily understand. So that consumer-facing aspect of our business where, yes, we sell the businesses, but our businesses create videos for consumers, mm -hmm. that's the angle that I think people find very fulfilling. As Luan5 becomes successful in this video generation, um, content generation idea, how I don't know, people know more about it, you, you found to see competition and copycats, so to speak, uh, that is trying to do the same thing, and you see more these uh, platforms in, in the market nowadays, how do you how do you you know solve the competition in the sense uh, you know how to how to fight the yeah. market? Yeah. So there, there's a funny story here too, which is um, 
there was a time, this was two years ago, somebody copied our website completely, mm. just took everything. Mm. Uh, the app doesn't work, it took the website, mm. put everything up, mm. and then filed a report to Google that we infringed on their copyright. Oh. And Google oh. removed our website oh, shit. from Google. Because oh. uh, they're like, hey, you infringed on these uh -huh. guys, they filed a report. Uh -huh. And we, we, what, we saw their website, yeah. like, that's our website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so crazy things happen yeah. in the business world. Not everybody likes to play fun and fair. And yeah. so, I mean, that wasn't a huge deal. <laughs> Uh, because I think we weren't relying that heavily on search engines. People mm -hmm. knew to come to Google Five and so forth. Uh, we eventually filed a report with Google, yeah. and they're like, "Hey, clearly their website just launched yesterday. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's going on?" Yeah. So we got an apology from Google, and that was all sorted out. Did they give um, you bad money or lost? No, Google doesn't do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so. Uh, they weren't really a serious competition, yeah. so yeah. to say, but you start to get these things, people try to take down yeah. your business or yeah. app in some shape or form. Um, nowadays, there's probably 10 different video creators that are similar interfaces, similar value proposition. Uh, even with Snipply, the previous company was like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Once you have something that makes attraction, people will copy it. Yeah, they'll copy it, they'll add their own. Like I, I, I have nothing against mm -hmm. copy. I think from coming from a design background, great art does come from copy. You copy something, you put your own twist on it, and that is innovation. So I have nothing against that. Even when they took the website and took us down Google, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, and so I've, I've never kind of shied away from that type of competition. If anything, I see it as like, competition is good for morale. It's like. Gather the team mm -hmm. around and be like, yeah. hey, there are people who are trying to catch up. What yeah. are we going to do to stay ahead? It forces innovation, and I think that's the whole point of capitalism. It's like, yeah, people can copy, they can do whatever they want. And that's what forces us to hire better people, get yeah. closer to our customers, be more creative, be more experimental, take bigger risks to try and continue to build the product just one step ahead. Uh, and I guess the famous example is always just like Apple. Apple mm -hmm. doesn't really build anything that can't be copied. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're always just a little bit ahead. Maybe they're thinking about, wireless headphones mm -hmm. just a little early than other people and they get that first mover advantage. And I think clones and copycats always suffer from this, they're one step behind. If mm -hmm. you are copying someone, you will always push out that feature just a little behind and that doesn't seem like a lot in isolation, but across a long period of time, you start to fall really far behind in the market. Um, so it's, it's been, I welcome competition and copycats and it's something that really drives us forward. So now with a bigger team now, uh, what kind of challenge do you face in terms of managing uh, you know, 25, 26 people instead of just a small team? The, the more recent challenges that we're running into is for the first 20 people, myself and my two co-founders directly manage everyone. Mm -hmm. For the first time, there are managers in the company that manage people, so mm -hmm. it's a degree of separation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it is a great challenge. There's a lot of trust involved in, um, we're doing a lot of work now to figure out metrics and key performance indicators so that we can judge performance based on the numbers and mm -hmm. not just through day-to-day -day interactions. Um, and that's a great challenge. Another thing is just focus. Um, the bigger the company is, the harder it is to pull everyone in the same direction, to move in the same direction. Um, one, one really interesting kind of saying I heard from a fellow founder is just 80% of the time, um, or actually 100% of the time, 80% of your team is working on the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, and so the, the CEO's job is to find those 20%. Yeah. Yeah and promote them and really spend time in fostering that, that talent and then uh, you know, making sure that the 80% is communicated to us. So, uh, and that's true for every company at the size of Google or Facebook. There will be people working on things that are not aligned with the vision. And even at 25, you start to see yeah. some of that. Um, and that's, that is the job of the CEO. Uh, and that was a question that I've thought of for a long time, which is like, what does the CEO do? Mm -hmm. If there's a VP here, a VP there, everyone's doing something, the CEO mm -hmm. doesn't seem like does anything, mm -hmm. um, but that is the job of CEO. Is lots of people are doing the wrong things. How do you make sure? How do you align? Them? How do you align them? How do you kind of coach them back into the, the right direction? Uh, and another analogy that I'd like to, to use is just like it's like you're you're a boat in the middle of the ocean and there's land everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter where you go, you'll still reach land. <laughs> and the only way to drown is when everybody paddles in different mm -hmm. directions yeah. and you stay in the middle mm -hmm. and you sink. Um, so that is what I'm struggling with. Any tools or platforms you're using to kind of align the whole team? 
I don't. I don't. I think it's too early for us to rely on technology. Yeah. Um, what I'm doing nowadays is just getting in front of the company. Uh, right now, I do it once every two weeks yeah. to talk about vision, talk about mm -hmm. what we're trying to work on, what our priorities are, trying to tie it back to people's individual contributions. So having this big goal, letting people know how their specific goal ties back to the big yeah. goal. Um, so there's a top-down approach to it. There's a bottom-up approach to yeah. it. It's over communication is the phrase that you'll hear a lot with Lumen Five. Yeah. Just over communicate. Always over communicate. Have you tried OK now? Uh, that we're doing that for the first time oh, that's this quarter. Yeah, that's uh, good. but it's 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 great in concept. Yeah. very difficult to implement. To implement right? Yeah, hold people accountable. So in November was when we started to educate the team mm -hmm. on what is called objectives and key results, which is a management philosophy. Um, there's lots of them out there, like four disciplines yeah. of execution or something. Um, and so we are trying OKRs. Yes. By the end of the quarter, we should have an idea of whether or not that will work well. Yeah, because we are trying to have a workshop on that. Yeah, on. it's good, it's yeah. good. It, especially for like 20, 25, OKRs are really good. In the earlier stages, maybe not so much. Like We didn't use OKRs yeah. for our four-person business because yeah. we were talking every day mm -hmm. and there was enough focus just through that context and interaction. Yeah. At 25, you need that um, objective yeah. to tie people together to the notes. Yeah. And if you have to go to the next phase where it's like 50, 100, yeah. um, exactly. you, know, you, you need to have somewhere to account for. Right. So yeah, that's good Good that you, you figure out that there's something to try. Yeah. So now that you've been to like 14, 15 startup now, um, yeah. you're going to, this is like a, a main thing that you see can be like a, a really big Big yeah, yeah, and and, I, and you probably noticed by now. I don't keep counts. If you <laughs> ask me, I'll try and yeah. count it. But for me, it's just like when I see a problem, I want to solve it. Yeah. Um, so whether this is like, whether there's twenty more after this, I, I don't see business in that sense. It's just if I come across a new problem that I think it's worth solving, I'll do my best to try and solve it. Uh, but Lumen Five is by far the biggest company, both in revenue potential, market, and head counts. Um, but the, the same was always true for every business. It yeah. was always the biggest sit in my career. Um, so I'm hoping that whatever Lumen 5 turns out to be, that the next company will be bigger, whatever that looks like. That's good. So now you learned a lot of lessons for these different, um, different startups and different businesses that you have been starting and build and kind of scale. Um, if you have to kind of give advice to the younger self, that how to start the first business or first idea. What would that be? Because we have some people in the audience that yeah. are trying to start the, the very first business, right? So I'll answer that in two ways. Yeah. There's like what I would tell my younger self yeah. and then like advice I would give here. Yeah. I wouldn't tell my younger self anything. Okay. Um, because I think like that journey was critical. Mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah. If I had told myself to avoid certain things, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have those things. So yeah. I, I wouldn't change anything, yeah. but that path is what got me. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what you came for, though. <laughs> uh, so I mean, you, I've touched on some of those throughout the stories. Like, mm -hmm. take the first step. That's always my first advice to everyone who is an aspiring founder but haven't taken the first step. Is don't even think about it. Take the first step. What is the what is the version zero point one of your product or your service? Don't think about getting your first ten customers. Get your first one customer and really make them happy. Um, so that first step is always the hardest. There's a lot of things that, I think the barrier is greatest in the first step because it's so complex. It's not just about business. Um, when I interact with early stage founders, there's an ego component to it. People don't want to start a company because they're afraid to be seen as a failure. Uh, a lot of times uh, people will say, oh, that's a stupid idea, you're gonna fail. And so there's just such a strong barrier in that first step. Um, or if you're at a very comfortable job and you're getting a salary, that first step is always the hardest. There's worries around what, is, what are my parents going to think. I know some people who are like <coughs> starting a company in secrets. They don't want to tell their family and they're sneaking out to the library every day pretending to go to work. Um, and so those things you just have to figure out. But once you figure out the first step, um, that's when you can truly focus on the business because you get everything else out of the way. You figured out that you don't need food anymore. You don't need to see your friends anymore, and like really, really figure that out. Um, so that's that's kind of early stage. Another thing that I, I think is really important to keep in mind is it's not like I've given up everything. Sure, I'm skinny, but I still like I get eight hours of sleep. I see my friends. I found some of my friends are here that I've known for a long time. Um, and so it, it's not like I'm working 15 hours a day. I live a very normal life, uh, and it's it's don't let that. 
be a decision detractor for you and that, oh, I don't want to start a company because I have to leave my family or abandon my child. Like, that's not true. Um, and it's the like, work life balance is just something in your control. You can have terrible work life balance at a full time job. There's nothing about entrepreneurship that necessitates that. Um, so, I, and then a lot of the other things that I talked about, which is like, don't focus too much on how fleshed out your idea is. Find this idea that you think will make one person happy, and then focus on seeing if you can find another person that you can make happy with the product or service you're building, and then another. And that's that's the iterative process. And that's how we eventually got to businesses with 500,000 mm -hmm. users. It's just how do we make one person happy, two people, and then 1,000, 5,000, and so forth. Uh, so that first step is very important and critical. Um, another thing that, that I, I kind of touched on as well, which is play to your strengths. Know what you're good at, know what you're not good at. Uh, play in the fields where you are good at. Find partners and, and team members who can compensate for your, what you're not good at. A lot of times I see founders fail because they'll play in a field that they don't understand at all. And of course they're going to fail. They don't know anything about the customers or the product mm -hmm. or the value. So if you're five business guys trying to start a tech company, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. If you're five tech guys trying to start a sales agency, it's not mm -hmm. going to work. And so um, part of that first step is a true, authentic self-assessment of your strengths and weaknesses. Are you a people person? Are you an introvert? Are you a good developer? Are you, do you know a lot about raising horses on a bar? Because mm -hmm. you could build a business around that too. Um, finding what you're good at is the first step to coming up with an idea. Um, and I always go back to know who you're building for because that makes life so much easier. Then you can figure out who you need to talk to every single day. What are their day to day? What are their challenges? And then work away from them. That's good. I have one last question before we open up to the floor for Granny. So you bootstrap your your couple last couple of startups into relatively uh, success. If you have to do it again, are you still going to bootstrap it, or are you trying to uh, raise funds to kind of boost it? Uh, that's the moment. Of it. Yeah. So th this is an interesting conversation. Um, so bootstrapping is a term that we use to describe entrepreneurs who build businesses without raising capital from outside investors, venture capitalists, angel investors. Um, it's it's one of those things that I've never really thought about. I know everybody raises money from their companies, uh, but I think it does come back to the fact that. I, just for me, it's about solving problems. Uh, a lot of founders who are in it to build a business, they will follow the kind of the, the, the Silicon Valley playbook. Mm -hmm. Come up with an idea, pitch investors, raise money, build the product. But when I look at that, I'm like, well, why would you raise money and then build the product? Mm -hmm. Build the product first, figure out what you want to do. Um, and so I've always not gone the fundraising routes because the, the early stages of finding product market fit is so chaotic, it's so all over the place. I can't possibly go to an investor with a plan of what's gonna happen. Um, and so that's kind of, it's a style of building business. You'll discover your own style. It's not like my style is right or wrong. Uh, but I like to take this very chaotic path. I like to take the first step and let things happen. Um, kind of uh, uh, just along the way, whatever feels right, talk to customers and, uh, wing it a little bit, I guess you can say. And that's not what investors want, right? They want to hear your one-year plan, two-year plan, five-year plan. And partially, I think, why I've avoided it is because of that fundraising experience with Needle HR, mm -hmm. where uh, it can actually impact your mm -hmm. view on your own business. Maybe you get unnecessarily discouraged mm -hmm. or um, unjustifiably encouraged, mm -hmm. which is just as dangerous. So I, I've always enjoyed having control over that process. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we won't fundraise for the mm -hmm. five. I think there's many reasons to fundraise. Some people fundraise to find product market fit. Some people fundraise to scale a mm -hmm. product that they found a fit for. Uh, I'm not opposed to doing that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if and when we feel like we're in a place where money is a bottleneck, I would absolutely consider mm -hmm. it. I think in Canada, we have the good fortune of having a lot of government support, mm -hmm. like IRAP and Shred, uh, which gives out millions of dollars to companies every year, uh, which makes it so that we're, we don't necessarily need to raise capital. Mm -hmm. A lot of government capital that's available. That's good, that's good. Thank you for, for your sharing. It's very good advice. And <laughs> so, let's open up to uh, questions uh, from the audience. You want to go first? Okay. Yep. Uh, just taking up from last bootstrapping. So, one mantra you suggested was uh, you know, hacking your way to customers with you know, getting the low hanging fruit. So how would you bootstrap? How did you, you know, acquire 400,000 customers? Just 
um, touch upon that. Yeah. So, uh, and I wouldn't I wouldn't get hung up on the four hundred thousand. Really, if you're bootstrapping, you're trying to try to find your first one thousand maybe. And I think if you have one thousand people who love your product, you can figure out a revenue model. Assuming you're not in the music business, which is very <laughs> difficult. Um, and then once you have revenue, you don't need to raise capital anymore. You're generating money. Uh, and how I would go about doing that is, is a combination of a couple things that we talked about is you have to be mindful of your personal lifestyle and expenditures. So bootstrapping is easy when you don't eat. If you're comfortable <laughs> sleeping under the bridge, bootstrapping is fine. Um, so, uh, you know, knowing how much you have in your savings is, goes a long way. And a lot of times uh, people fail to bootstrap because they have a mortgage. And so those are things that are difficult to control. And that's why I always recommend it. If you're thinking about starting a business, and it's early in your life, now is the best time. It just gets harder when you have more responsibilities. Um, and now, like, you could you could grow old without responsibilities. Those are all life choices, so it's not exclusive to that. Uh, and then bootstrapping, for me, actually is an advantage. So a lot of times people ask, oh, are you at a disadvantage against your competitors because you don't fundraise, they have millions of dollars. It always goes back to classic stories, David and Goliath, and Wright Brothers, and, and so forth. And you hear these stories again and again. My understanding of it is when you have very little resources, you're forced to focus. You're focusing, I don't have time to build 10 products for 100 people. I only have time to not even build a product, build one feature for one person. Mm -hmm. That laser focus actually allows you to make much more progress than a company who has $10 million. Now, how are they going to spend that $10 million? They're not mm -hmm. going to spend all $10 million on one feature for one person. They're going to experiment with 10 products for 100 people, maybe 1,000 people. And at the end of that journey, they go, well, nothing worked. Mm -hmm. And so we're closing shop. And you'll hear that a lot is venture back company that raised hundreds of millions of dollars. They've laid off all their staff. And they, they usually don't really give you a reason in the media. They're uh, market conditions, <laughs> you know, something. Um, but bootstrapping forces you to focus as a founder, it forces the team to focus. Um, and so that has always been something that I've seen as an advantage to uh, getting to the, to, if I can get a thousand people to love the product, then I can get 400,000 people to love the product. That's good. Next one. Okay. Hi, Michael. Uh, I wanted to ask, you spoke a lot about uh, playing your strengths as a co-founder and as someone who's been a co-founder, what was your strength and what was that strength that you always played to that brought everyone to the team and wanting to continue to work with you? Mm. Um, I think that has changed over time. Like my strengths 12 years ago was very different than my strengths now. Uh, looking back in retrospect, I think having that um, design background is a very unique aspect as a founder. Uh, there are design-oriented founders out there, but I think um, they're not that common. And so that design focus really wires my brain towards thinking about solutions, thinking about customers. Uh, by default, I don't think about revenue because I come from a design background, so I'm always focused on you know, what is the yeah the user experience? What is the what is the user journey, and how do we get them to a point where they can get value, whatever that is? Um, and that has resonated with a lot of people. Uh, engineers, I think, are also wired in a similar way. It's solutions oriented, uh, and so I've worked well with technical co-founders in that sense, where I come up with the user experience and the user journey, and they're actually able to map that to the technical roadmap of what that implementation looks like. So I've always played to my strengths in that sense. Uh, most of our products are quite design heavy. So there's a relatively unique or intricate user experience involved in that process as opposed to, let's say, building an analytics platform, which is less user experience focused and more maybe technical or data science focused. Um, and then also playing the strengths of my co-founders. I have two technical co-founders, which means we can afford to build more complex solutions like AI uh, and rely on technology more so than if I were working with two salespeople, um, I might go enterprise sales. So that would be the strengths. And then on the weaknesses side, which I think like weaknesses are more important, knowing what they are and building around them. Um, and it goes back to the same thing. Is I'm not a natural salesperson. My co-founders don't like sales. They don't like the sales process. And that's why we spend time thinking about um, acquisition loops and viral loops. How do we build this thing so that we don't need to go sell? Because that's not what we're good at. Uh, so, and that's another thing too, is I was saying earlier, if you know what weaknesses are, go hire for them. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you do, but you could also try and figure out smart ways to build it in such a way that you can yeah, avoid yeah. playing in the areas of weaknesses. And for us, that's typically was the same thing. Sales and marketing is just not something that we're naturally good at. And so we built the product so that it can take care of sales and marketing. So it's a very engineering approach to marketing. And that's the combination of playing to your strengths and weaknesses. How do you leverage your strengths to overcome your weaknesses? Awesome. All right. Uh, 
I'm wondering, I'm looking at bootstrapping as well, just because I feel like this product has way too much potential to just promise someone like 25%. Uh, and how did you divvy up the, the shares between you and your CTO and your CMO, like your marketing guy and your technology guy, how did you divvy that up? Or how would you if you were to start over with zero money right now? Yeah, so our, our chief product officer and chief technology officer are my two co-founders. Um, so it's equal shares. I always believe in equal shares because we lose so much of that barrier. I know friends who kind of don't go by that model. So let's say you have an 80-20 mm -hmm. and, and you have two co-founders, but you don't really have equal partnership. Mm -hmm. One person has more partnerships, uh, more, more equity mm -hmm. than the other. So I don't think it's as simple as like five people, three people, two people. Mm -hmm. The specific divide within that cap table also matters. I'm always a fan of having equal shares with equal founders. Uh, I, to me, that makes life easier so that when you are successful, you are successful together. When you are failing, you are failing together. Uh, that's something that, in my view, removes a lot of unnecessary conflicts uh, and just being on the same page. Now, when hiring a CMO or hiring people, that's what we usually put under the employee stock options plan. Those companies would allocate 10 or 20 percent to that pool, and you would assign your chief level executives based on what you think their market value is worth. One good way to look at it is you can forecast how much your shares are worth. You can use that to justify paying them less than market rate, which is common in a startup. You, you can't really compete mm -hmm. with $500,000 salary from Amazon. Mm -hmm. But what you can say is, um, you know, we can offer $100,000 and we forecast your stocks to be worth $800,000. Uh, so that's how it constructs. Right, it's warrants. It's warrants, mm -hmm. basically. But do you take those warrants back when they leave the company? That is up to you, and so usually there's a cliff in a vesting like, period, so they'll have to stay for at least a year before they start vesting, and normally it's a three or four year vesting period where they have to stay, uh, upon which they can choose to exercise by buying your shares, your stock options, um, or if they choose not to exercise it, you as a company can decide in the clause whether you allow them to walk away with the rights to buy it at a future point in time, or if they walk away and they don't get to buy it. Or they have to give us something in exchange for walking away. It's like, you walk away, you have to like find someone to replace you. <laughs> well, that's common. Yeah. You will, yeah. You will get this to Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Mark and Marcus, I got to ask, how did you come up with the names of every one of your companies? Is there like, is there like, is there like a website generator? You could <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I cared a lot about names in the early days. Eventually, you just realize that a name's a name. Everything sounds funny when it's not big, and then when it's big, it just sounds normal. Like, Apple sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Apple's Apple. Um, so I wouldn't say I put an incredible amount of thoughts into it. I think a lot of names, you apply meaning to it afterwards. Um, so uh, it's not a name generator, but it's as close as you can get to that. That's good. Yeah, uh, there was a consistent theme in your stories about giving customer acquisition priority over revenue or profits. So at least that's what I uh, gleaned from it. Uh, was it um, easy for you to do that because you were bootstrapping, so you didn't have the VC standing behind you? And was it also easy because your businesses are not capital intensive, and was it by choice? Yeah, so, so there's, you, you hit on a, uh, they're all correct. Um, not having VCs does make it much easier, but I'll put a caveat to that, which is if you find the right investors who are aligned with you, they won't push you mm -hmm. to generate early day revenue. So that's a really important conversation to have. And I always go back to these like dating marriage analogies, but VC is the same way. You're, you're committing to a partnership with someone, so it's important to communicate the expectations. Uh, do you want me to generate revenue in the first year? Uh, I don't plan to, are you okay with that? And having that conversation up front will allow you to get the funding you need without the unnecessary pressure. Uh, now they have the rights to walk back on their work, but you know you still want to do everything you can to mitigate that. Um, and so uh, the other side to it is, I think I've always valued figuring out what's worth selling first, so deliver the value and then charge people for it, as opposed to charge people for it and then figure out the value because they won't pay you if you haven't delivered the value. So that's something that I've, I've always believed strongly in. Uh, and then the other thing is just the, the design background influences that, is I'm more passionate and drawn to creating solutions first because we don't come from a business background. We're less excited about things like pricing models, unit economics. Uh, those to us is an afterthought. 
But that's also a factor of building a business around the strengths and weaknesses of the team as well. And uh, to the last part of your question, I do absolutely agree that because of that way we like to build businesses, we gravitate towards low capital intensive ideas, like tech products that can be built with lines of code. Going back to my example, friends at Bessie, very expensive. They gotta make all these shoes and then sell the shoes. It's a very capital intensive exercise. Um, so it's not right for everyone. But even if you need a lot of capital, it's not always VCs. They kickstarted their business, uh, they raised a couple million dollars on Kickstarter. So there are alternative ways to fundraising as well. And if you do it through Kickstarter, nobody can push you to generate revenue. They, they don't have any control over your business. It's a great way to fundraise. There's no equity involved in Kickstarter. That's good. Oh, there's old uh, So you, you spoke about uh, running simply and uh, Google Fly in parallel, right, for some time. Uh, I want to know, so you, you, you mentioned that you focus kind of just the right towards Google Fly only, right? Uh, I want to know, like, with your co-founders, have you guys always had a basic plan for Sleepy from the beginning? And also, like, what, what makes you decide to sell instead of, you know, hire a team, hire a CEO to replace you guys and keep it running because it was profitable? Like, what was the reason? Yeah, so I'll answer that question in two parts as well. Is the exit plan, you get asked that a lot, like what's the exit plan, what's the exit plan? Some founders have elaborate exit plans. It's, it's Again, it's my own personal style. I don't think about much about the exit plan. Um, and I always look to, what, what was Steve Jobs thinking when he built the business? What was Mark Zuckerberg thinking? And I don't think they were thinking about an exit plan. So I always just focus on, let's build a product, let's deliver value. The exit is something that happens, uh, if and when, at that point in your life. Sometimes businesses take decades to build. Uh, I might not want to exit now, but if I'm 50, uh, I might want to exit, maybe retire, whatever that looks like. So I think, uh, I don't think about an exit plan. It's important for investors. So if you're raising money, you need an exit plan, because they need to know when they're going to get their money back and how they're going to get their money back. If you go to an investor and you say, I have no exit plan, then they're never going to get the return. So um, those are also some of those things where in bootstrapping a business, I've had the luxury to not have to think about an exit plan. Um, as far as hiring someone to run the company, I think it went down to focus. Finding a team to run a company is extremely difficult. Finding the right CEO, managing their expectations, creating a compensation package that's sufficiently enticing for them to stay motivated. Uh, there's the risk of, let's say, you do hire a CEO and a team, three months later he decides to leave, then you gotta jump back, I gotta walk away from room five, do this all over again. Um, so the way I looked at it was just, it wasn't so much monetarily driven, but I knew that if I didn't get rid of it completely, it will always be a distraction and it will draw focus away from building Lumen 5. And what we really wanted to do was build Lumen 5. Um, and so uh, another kind of really interesting opportunity to share that lesson is I always thought that acquisitions come in these huge numbers. You, you, you're sold to Facebook for hundreds of millions of dollars. Through the acquisition process, what we learned is you can sell a business for anything. You can sell a business for $5,000, for $10,000, for $100,000. Um, and so the exit plan is actually very fluid and flexible. You can build a business, uh, in retrospect, I feel like I, instead of closing down a lot of those companies, I could have sold them. There's a market for everyone. And it goes back to the, the talent comparison is, yeah, some people only want to work with a big company. Some people only want to buy big companies. Some people are just around to buy $5,000, $10,000 websites. Um, there are lots of portfolio investors who specialize in turnaround exercises where they'll buy a failing company and they'll turn it around. So there's lots of liquidity opportunities out there. Uh, and that was a key lesson that I learned in selling simply. And I think for a long time we didn't sell it because I thought that it wasn't big enough to be sold until I actually engaged in some of these exercises and started to find out that, yeah, there's lots of buyers out there. Excuse me. Uh, okay, that's good. <laughs> Last chance so, before the dash. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, this one is about the product market fit. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you know after you validate the value, the USD, right? How do you know that you hit our market fit? Right? Is it based on the number? Is it based on the, the revenue number? Yeah. So, um, for those who don't know, uh, uh, USB is a unique selling proposition. Uh, I assume that's what you're yeah, yeah. You're very good at this spending. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's something that we try at our company. Sometimes people join us. Uh, you hire an engineer and then we use like business yes. jargon and then it makes them feel left out. So I have a habit of like <laughs> explaining <laughs> acronyms. Uh, and there's a lot of technical acronyms that I don't understand that I keep telling them to explain, but they, they won't. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I, I always, I use the term product market fit as well. It's not my favorite term because I, I think the, the term product market fit almost makes it sound like it's a binary state, that it either happens or it doesn't happen. 
But in reality, your product is moving, but the market's also moving. So you could have product market fit one day and completely lose it the day after. Uh, so the, the, the kind of even the phrasing of the question makes it sound like, how do you find product market fit? It's, it's not really finding it. It's like, how do you keep, the mar as the market moves, you're moving your product and you're trying to stay in this trajectory. And that's where that industry insights and forecast becomes really important, is if you don't know which direction, if the market's moving this way and your product's moving this way, you will lose product market fit. And that's why companies rise and fall. Mm -hmm. uh, you have companies like MySpace, which mm -hmm. found product market fit, and then lost product market fit because the market shifted away. Um, and so it's, a, it's an ongoing exercise. I don't think you ever truly know whether or not you have it. There are some gimmicks and tricks like net promoter score or something. You send out a survey. Uh, if, we, if the product disappeared, how upset would you be? And you can rank it out of zero to 10. And if your score is like eight to 10, then you have product market fit. That's, so there are ways that you can work around that. Uh, but just because you get an eight or 10 one day, mm -hmm. absolutely does not mean that tomorrow the company would be completely off the mark. There's just so many things that happen day to day. It depends on user sentiment too, user because sentiment. there are some things that are not measurable. Maybe you're not asking <coughs> powerful enough questions, like like uh, how do you like the email support? Oh, now we can talk, you know, because I'll respond totally differently to that question if you bring that right. up, you know. Yeah, and, and to provide a bit more example of that, SEO is an entire industry that at multiple points in time was completely destroyed because Google decided to tweak their algorithms a little bit. Yeah. So that's like you found product market fit because you're able to provide SEO services for how the current search uh, ranking algorithm works. They make one decision and the entire market has lost its fit. Go post. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last chance for questions. Uh, you mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, starting to look at like what, what's going to be a trend, video's going to be a trend. So we're going to see anything uh, around like TikTok or uh, you know gang gang videos because that seems to be a nice trend. Yeah. So I, I, if we go deep into video, I divide it between like consumer facing videos, business videos, and so forth. So we are a B two B video solution. TikTok, in my view, is still largely a consumer play. There is an ad network on TikTok. That's where I think there's a lot of opportunity for us, is help people create TikTok video ads, which are played on TikTok. Uh, in the context of TikTok itself, I don't currently see an opportunity. Uh, revenue potential among young teens is generally not an easy market to grab. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, yeah, um, so if you can meet a tech innovator, say like Steve Jobs or Jack Ma or Mark Zuckerberg, who would you want to meet and why? Do you know? I feel like you know so much about me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Elon Musk would be a good one. So, so yeah. one, one that I always talk about is actually Steve Jobs. Um, and it's particularly in, I think, He's just had a wild journey, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the specific thing, and I'm, I'm actually less impressed with Apple than the fact that he got kicked out of Apple mm -hmm. and started Pixel, uh, which is something that I think mm -hmm. is not necessarily common knowledge, but for someone to walk away from a tech company and then create it in one of my, like, those are two of my favorite companies, uh, and I didn't know they were founded by the same person under those circumstances. Uh, so I would, I would be fascinated to know what was going on in his mind at the time, what were his strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses. Uh, I like kind of turnaround failure stories where people go from everything to nothing and then just come back. Because um, I think there's so many founders out there where you just don't know if it's a one hit wonder or they lucked out. And I think uh, Jobs is one of those rare characters who, despite all odds, have actually done it multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's something about him that's unique. I'd, I'd love to see what that's all. That's good. Thanks. Last chance. Going once. Okay. There you go. <laughs> you, you're bootstrapping, you're building a world class product. You know, are you happy with the talent available in BC in Vancouver? So, I mean, I, I have a very long answer to that question, but I'll try and summarize it. What I love about Vancouver level talent is they they are at a every every talent ecosystem goes through these stages. We're in a stage where Vancouver-based people are wide-eyed, they're inspired, they want to do what the people are doing in Valley. We had just enough successes to inspire people, like Hootsuite, that was like, oh, they, they almost became a billion dollar company, that's so exciting, I want to hop onto the next, next Hootsuite. Um, but we're at that stage, which I think is actually the best stage. When you go look at more mature markets, 
um, like the Valley, you start to get people who have been, who've listened to people like me talk about vision enough times. They're like, ah, like it's, it's more BS from more CEOs. So you start to see that uh, the mature talent ecosystem has been more jaded. They don't care as much about stock options. They're like, I have enough stock. They call it play money. <laughs> and, uh, and then people who work for startups are like, I have enough play money. I have stocks in three other startups that I worked at. This is nothing new. You start to get uh, more of a mercenary uh, mentality. So you're joining a company to flip salaries and you're going somewhere else. So what I love about the Vancouver talent ecosystem is it's so startup friendly. Everyone in here is excited, sufficiently excited, and haven't seen enough failures to be jaded by that experience. Uh, so it's actually a really exciting time to build a company in Vancouver. And that's what I'm seeing. And uh, we do interview people from different ecosystems. That's how I'm able to draw that comparison, is we'll interview someone mm -hmm. from the Valley, we'll interview someone here, we'll interview someone from Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can really see the maturity, uh, and I don't mean maturity as in like good or bad, it's just the mentality shifts from city to city. And the core talent? And the core talent of the you know, engineers here? Um, I think it's great here because uh, if you're in the AI space, you know that Canada is the AI leader of the world. Um, it's, it's kind of a funny thing because most of the AI leaders are in Eastern Canada, but people from out of Canada don't know that. They just think Canada is great. So we actually do hire from, from, from China and Netherlands and India from people who are like Canada is the AI leaders, even though the, the true thought leaders are more in Eastern Canada. Um, so a lot of people I think are moving to Canada, tech talents. Uh, Amazon, Apple coming here, Microsoft, all helps with that. And then a lot of boot camps that are coming up. Um, Launch Academy has their own stuff, Brain Station and so forth. So I think there's a whole generation of technical talent that's coming up right now. Uh, and those people within a few years will be very high functioning developers. Okay, Dash. Um, yeah, I'm going to curious to know. Uh, so you, you said that you're going to the, through the transition right now of being a CEO to an executive. Um, I want to know, like, what what's the amount of employees you under you know you imagine that you feel the need to transit into that role? So there's, there's an analogy, actually Amazon uses this, which is the two pizza rules, is in your immediate team, two pizzas should be enough to serve. That's usually like seven, seven or eight people. Um, anytime you have more than seven or eight direct reports, you start to lose touch with those people. So with three co-founders, that's about 21 people. So once we're at the 26 mark, that's when we start to feel the stress of what we need management layers, we need people. Once you go beyond the seven direct reports, you can't really provide the quality of management and leadership that they deserve and require. Um, so seven is kind of my magic number when it comes to that. And I would say it's seven per, uh, I wouldn't say per co-founder, but per reliable leadership within the company. So if you have five people that are great leaders, then maybe you can have, hire more Stretch people. Um, but yeah, I, I always try to, I, I, I'm guilty, I'm not currently at seven. I think I'm currently managing closer to 11. Um, but really what I'm trying to get to is seven. And I do that by hiring a director of sales, director of marketing, to try and make it so that my direct reports are seven directors mm -hmm. instead of um, 14 specialists. That's good. Okay. Last chance. Going once, going twice. All right. Big hands. Thank you.